I discovered Richard Potter over 40 years ago when as a magician I wanted to do magic from the early 1800s and he was the first successful magician in America, an amazing black gentleman who worked all over the United States. Driving up here, I drove through Westford, he performed there. It's nice to be in Portsmouth where he performed and worked as well. I can share with you his magic, but afterwards a gentleman is gonna share with you the story of Richard Potter, John Hodgson, Potter the citizen, Potter the husband, Potter the father, part of the person who made a living all over the United States back in the 1820s and 30s doing magic and ventriloquism. And I once joked that I once had an hour and a half slide program on Richard Potter's life that no one ever cared to see or hear. <laughs> There's always a look of terror in someone's eyes when you say slides an hour and a half. No. <laughs> For the first 25 minutes or so, I'd like to share with you some of the magic of Richard Potter. That the broadsides of Richard Potter tell you what he did. Magic books of the 18th and 19th century tell you how to do the magic. Some of the books have what to say while you're performing. So when I tap my conjuring stick upon the table three times, I'm gonna become Richard Potter and you become the citizens of Portsmouth and you come to a show. So for the next 25 minutes or so, all this magic is the kind of things that Richard Potter could have done back 180 to 200 years ago. So are you ready to go back in time? Yeah. Mr. Potter should be here in about four seconds, if you pardon me for one moment, please. Good day to all assembled. The curiosities I bring before you and cause answers to appear in your ken before the question is but bespoke. But some would speak against Mr. Potter. They say a thief or scoundrel, valuable things betwixt his fingers would be taken. No. If I were a thief, would I be bold enough to show you how to capture me? Never. So most wondrous place I show and share that all would see. Kind lady, hold upon one end. Kind lady, take the other. And look upon this place. Is this not lace quality and beauty? Would you agree? Yes. yes. But a scoundrel would steal and run. The ladies cry, do not. I shall offer you a nostrum at no charge how to prevent thievery. Use a lace to make a snare, and you tie the ends together into a tight knot. First end over the second, second over the first, and pull it tight. You may pull a knot. Make a tight, sir. Pull, pull, pull. It's a tight, sir. Thank you, sir. Here, then, is a knot. But a scoundrel might know words of an arcane nature and look at a tight knot and then blow on it. It would then disappear right before your eyes. But I know some say he ties a knot to a slippery nature. Dear lady, will you tie the knot? Don't look shocked. I haven't asked you to marry me. <laughs> Just tie the ends together in any manner as you wish. She makes a stand out eye and another and then pull it as tight as you wish it to be. Is it not tight? Yes. Do you wish to tie another one? Sure. Uh, trust goes out the window quickly, <laughs> does it not? <laughs> there are this three knots. Knot. Is that tight as well? Yes? Yes. Do you wish to tie one more? No, I don't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it helps to be a ventriloquist. Now, you see, she has made a tight snare, but I'm going to give you the secret. The deception is the knot. Everyone looks upon the knot, and while they look upon this end, upon the other end, he escapes. You bar the front door, he comes in the back. He steals your chicken, your silver plates, and the young lady's scissors. You may hold them. Now, if you have a snare, this is much too large. Put it twice about a scoundrel's wrist. He begins to be caught, but maybe the knot will slip. Pull upon the knot. Is it still tight? The knot is tight, the snare though, we should put four times about, and now look, I'm captured and caught and fettered up, and the only way to escape is if someone in their kindness were to cut. Oh good, you brought your scissors, thank you. <laughs> now some will say, I think Mr. Potter loosened the knot, pull on it, is it still tight? Yes. You have the scissors, you're gonna open your scissors, and you're gonna reach up, and you're going to cut the knot. And she cuts, yes, right there, just that, you cut more than just the knot, you cut it into four pieces. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're sorry, that's my last piece of lace. 
There's a remnant of the knot. You can cut that off. It's not doing anyone any good. Yes, you may have it. Uh, I will take the scissor back for our mutual protection. I was a bit late. I do apologize. So you see, had she gotten to just the knot, and I had gotten to just the knot, I'd have one piece with two ends. I am now stuck with four pieces attested to. There were two ends, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Look, I have cut the ends off all four pieces, and they have reappeared back on the ends of all four pieces. Are you not amazed? <laughs> I'm going to cut them again. Are you amazed yet, madam? They're getting shorter all the time. You just tell me when you're amazed. No? Yeah. Never mind. I banter to cover my embarrassment. You see, dear lady, I rushed. My error. Do you accept my apology? Oh, I do. I have four pieces. You can have any one. Choose an end. Is that the one you want? Mm -hmm. Hold it up high. You accept my apology? Yes. Then if I say hocus pocus, why do I not give this gentle lady a piece of lace and hold condition back again? <laughs> one whole piece, and I thank you. So now you see Mr. Potter's bill. He destroyed an error, but rewoven as the French lace makers have taught me. So the question posed to the assembly, would you play at cards at Mr. Potter? Oh. Not for money, I heard that. I offer sage advice, especially those with children. Be very cautious never to be caught cheating at gambling. My grandmother said to me many years ago, a gentleman should never be caught cheating at cards. I made a promise to her at that very moment. I can tell you now, 37 years later, I have kept my promise to my grandmother. And in 37 years, I have never been caught cheating a card. <laughs> what do you think I keep in my pocketbook? A pack of cards. Who will hold them for me? <laughs> Gentle lady, yes, come forward. Oh, not to be afraid. You should reach into the pocketbook and grab them all. And look into the pocketbook, empty or full. Yep. Tell them, empty or full. <laughs> An empty pocketbook. Now, gentle lady, I shall show the cards to yourself and all are here. A knave of diamonds, a three of hearts, a knave of hearts. There are clubs, red cards, black cards, spot cards, all different. Would you agree? Are they all different? They are. Shall I mix or leave? Your choice. Mix. Mix. Trust goes out the window completely, does it not? <laughs> I mix them here, I mix them there. Are they mixed better to your liking? Yes? Yeah, they're good. I'm going to turn them face downward so I cannot see. I turn pages upon a book. When you want a card, say stop. Stop. Did I stop exactly where you wished? Yes. Some will say, I watch you to speak. And as you began to get stop, I tie my thumb to stop here to make you take that card. If you think that, we can go further down. No, I'm OK. Are you sure? I'm sure. Are you positive? I'm positive. You don't want to change? A medical or semi-religious nature. <laughs> a lovely lady who wouldn't change her mind. Take the card. Here are the three of hearts. Next, the knave of diamonds. Eight of hearts. Many different cards. Now, show your card to the assembly. Let them see it. She shows the card. I then here ask, who shall hold my unfortunately empty portfolio? Take it, sir. Please open it up and look within. Hold it up high for all to see. Is it empty? I ask you, sir, hold a stick. The card I show to the gentleman. You see her card? Yes. You've seen the card. Mm -hmm. I've seen the card. <laughs> it makes a difference that I've seen it. It is not what this card is, what it shall do before your eyes. To the gentle lady, was this a card of free choice? Yes? Yes. Remember, she could have changed, she did not. Second question, can I take this card, change it to a bird, fly about the assembly, lighting on seven persons' head, and the bird shall end up upon his head? Will it change to a bird? I don't know. <laughs> well, you may have nothing to worry about. If it is to fly, I mark it. I tear the king's robe. I tear his girdle. I tear his stocking. He is marked. You tear the corner yourself. Take it, dear lady. Pull the card and hold the corner tight. You, sir, <laughs> place the card into the portfolio. You rise upon your place that they may see you do it. You hold it down. They'll think trickery upon my part and place it into the paper, sir. Then close three sides, leave one open so we can see the card, and show them there. Can you see the card? Show them in the back, can you see the card? Show them by the door, can you see the card? 
Well, if you'd been here earlier, you could be sitting in the front and you'd see the cop. <laughs> Close the paper. Close the portfolio. Hold it in our hand, up high for all to see. The stick of magnetic emanation, the corner you tore, touched to the end of the stick. It begins. And now to the portfolio. Go! Did you see it move? I just pushed you with the stick. Weren't you paying attention? <laughs> you chose the king. You put the king in here. Do you think it changed to a bird? Mm. Fly out! Did you see it fly? No. Oh, did I forget to tell you it might be invisible? <laughs> you close the paper. Open the paper, sir. Is the card there? The quizzical look upon his face would ascertain it is not. A bit of fluff remains. The card is gone, you see. I thank you, sir. <laughs> now, some say it's on the back. Is it on the back? It is not on the back. Some say it's underneath. Look underneath. Is it underneath? No. No, the stick. It touched the corner you tore off. It touched the portfolio the gentleman held. And where does the stick rest now? Upon the empty pocketbook. Was the pocketbook empty? Please pick up the empty pocketbook, gentle lady. Face the assembled gentle lady. Open the empty pocketbook and take out whatever you find and tell all what is there. There seems to be a king of clubs with a corner missing. Hold her heart. But some say not the same. Compare the corner you tore off. Does it match exactly in every shape, form, and five of the same card, yes or no? Yes. yes, indeed. I thank you, dear lady, and you may have a call. Okay. <laughs> you have the call for assisting me, it's of no use, someone told the corner roll. <laughs> so now I ask you to trust me. If I ask you to trust me, then I must trust you. I trust you with my money. Who will count my coin of copper, coin of silver? You only have to count to two. <laughs> or count the one twice. Who will hold the coin? Mr. Lady, if you step forward, please. I pour upon your hand all the contents. How many coins do I give you? One or two? Two. What's in the box? Nothing. Nothing in the box. Now, gentle lady, you hold the coins. Who shall hold the printed coin? You can pick any one you wish. This is called getting even. <laughs> now, if you gentle lady step upon this side, open the cloth to be assured there is no trickery, no holes. Is there a hole on that side? Nope. Is there a hole on the other side? <laughs> you have to shake both sides. The hole might only go halfway through. <laughs> Unless it can be seen on one side, because as you know, a half a hole is harder to see than a whole hole. <laughs> the coins are received. If the receptions are eliminated, the coins will cease to exist. Do not listen to me, listen to the gentle ladies. How many can you feel? Two. Hold them up and show. How many can you see? Two. Perception of sight, perception of touch. Now the perception of sound. How many can you hear? <laughs> Yesterday a gentleman said one. I said, which one? The one doing the tapping? The one being tapped. <laughs> a punch that he came upon his face, he staggered back to the tavern. <laughs> the next reception is for the nose. Ooh! <clears throat> oh, gentle lady, I apologize. You may wish to wash your delicate fingers later. <laughs> a vulgar scent, but I am told Dr. Franklin once wrote in Paul Richard's Almanac, if the copper coin doesn't have a scent, it cannot be a penny. The vulgar humor, you lose a silver. The last perception is taken. No. No. <laughs> I would not then abide to ask the gentle lady to taste that, because you know you have no idea what this coin has been. This could have fallen on a stable floor, which is why it smells so bad. Now, if I move it in the cold air and hold tight, the scent goes away. Now, sound is gone. What do you hear? Nothing. And what do you feel? Nothing. And touch is gone. And the last perception of sight. How many? Two. How many? Two. Raise the cloth, gentle lady, cover the coins over the top. And now they are gone. Uh, <laughs> the look of doubt comes upon her gentle face. Feel there. 
Are they there? Yes. yes. She's feeling better. Feel <laughs> there. Are they there? Now the question posed, do you think we can trust this lady to hold my money? Uh. <laughs> it's my money, what do you worry about? <laughs> Deal here first. How many beneath? Tell them. Tell them. Two. Deal here. Mm -hmm. How many? Two. Pinch tight, one hand. Keep high. Empty. Other hand, grab here, close the sack. Now, you have a choice now of copper or silver. Which would you rather have? Silver. Silver. Do not the ladies choose silver at first choice, every chance they get. <laughs> Empty hand. This hand you hold tight. I want you to put the center of the cloth upon my hand here. You put that hand there, hold up high. You want the silver, I will have to take a copper coin out of it, And seal it up. You may shake it. You separate the warp and weft, pluck out the copper coin, seal the other back up, and the coin that left I lost from my teeth. And as you can see, there is no hole upon the cloth on either side. Say they were in concert with me. <laughs> you wouldn't tell a lie for me, would you? Maybe a white lie. You oh. <laughs> <laughs> must remain within the 1830s, shall we go? <laughs> Who will hold the silver coin in the cloth? You can choose. Oh, the gentleman in the back. Quickly now, come forward. Who will hold the copper coin? It's hard to give copper away when the silver falls. Pick someone you like. Or well, pick someone you don't like. <laughs> Thank you. Applause to the gentleman, ladies and gentlemen. Can you each feel a coin? Yes? Yes. yes. The perception of touch has come back and you didn't see it coming. Can you see both coins? Yes. The perception of sight has come back. Can you hear both coins? Yes. The perception of sound has come back. <coughs> Don't put that one in your mouth, no. <laughs> An empty box. What's in the box? <laughs> Drop the copper coin in the box. Can you see it? Yes. Can you hear it? Yes. How many? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Can you hear it? Yes. How many? One. Can you see the copper coin? Yes. Can you hear it? Yes. How many in the box? One. How many at his fingertips? One. In the box. One. Fingertips. Box. One. Put your hand out, gentle lady. I balance here. Oh, you think I steal? No. The copper coin of little value. It is a silver coin you must go for. Open the cloth, sir. Look upon it. Is there a hole here? A hole there? Is there a hole anywhere? Nope. If there is no hole, then it must be a whole cloth. <laughs> oh. You may cover the silver, sir. Lay it over the top. Pick it up yourself. Grab it here tight. Other hand, grab here, and stand like that forever. <laughs> Maybe just five days now. Gentle lady, you please come here. Feel the coin. Is it there? How many? One. Till then. One. Thank you. Step back. Look in the box, sir. How many? Uh, I didn't see any. I hear one. You do not trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I show you what trust is? Yes. One, two, three. One. None. I shake an empty box. Pull the lid out, gentle lady. Shake it. How many do you find? Someone has taken the cup. <laughs> Pinch the contents, sir. You had one. How many do you feel now? Two. Two. Hold tight, sir. Reach underneath. Take out whatever you find. Where there were upon his gentle fingers. One coin now, sir. Hold up and show. How many? Two. Two coins, and there is no hole upon the cloth on either side. <laughs> thank you. And I thank you. We come to close. We began the pack of cards. We finish with the same pack. Some say, I think he makes people take cards of his choice. No. Some say he has a trick pack all the same. No. If cards are to be had, who then here is a doubter amongst you that might wish to have their own card? Mm -hmm. Who?
people would like cards. They're free, no choice, no cost. <laughs> no one? Here, sir, take two or three or four, whatever you wish, a little from each hand. And more, more, take more, take more. Step here, sir, kind sir. And take some more if you wish. Who else would like to have cards? Raise your hand. Can the lady come forward? Please take a few from each hand. <laughs> she doesn't trust me. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want them to come back? Yes. You have too many. Oh. Take some more. Oh, here. Take another. And do you want some more? No, I'm fine. You sure? <laughs> Who else would like cards? <clears throat> Gentle lady. Take a few cards. And take some more. And some more. And join your friend. Now, look at your cards. Are they all different? Yes? Yes. No. I should. Show me the ones that are the same. I'm counting wrong, but they look the same to me. I, no, you have to count the spots. Those are ten spots on that. Those are eight spots on that. They are different, yes? Oh, yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> I turn away. Math was never my strong suit. I will not look. Go through your cards. When you find one that you like, take one card out and put it behind your back so I cannot see. Have these taken a card? Yes? Is it behind their back? Yes. Yeah. One card behind your back. You each have one? You have one, sir? Keep one. Give me those. Gentle lady, have one. Keep one. Give me those. Gentle lady, one. Keep one. I turn away. I will not look. Each of you take out your card, show everyone, let them see it. Have you seen their cards? Have you seen them now? Yes. Put them behind your back. I'm going to place the cards here. Gentle lady, whenever you want, you say stop. Stop. Put your card right there, face down. Gone within, her card is nine from the bottom. But if I cut them, the position changes. I mix them, the card is lost in the packet. Are you happy with your card? Oh, cool. You don't want to change? No. I'm going to throw them here upon my hand whenever you want, and you say stop. Stop. Put your card face down right there. Her card now, I've lost because I didn't count, but I cut, so they are gone, and I mix. Gone. Now, the gentleman, sir, are you happy with your card, yes. or will you trade for another? No. Remember, he could have changed. He did not. When you want, sir, you say stop. Put your card right there, sir, face down. Three cards taken, cut into the pack, and mixed. Gone. The question posed, can I find the cards? I cannot find them. They are lost in the packet. You are going to have to help me find them. I bring other devices, a stick of magnetic emanation, the tin shovel, please take that, <laughs> and a piece of red silk cloth. I give all away. Look upon the stick, gentle lady. Is it wet or dry? Dry. Touch the stick to the cards. Any movement? Any adhesion? Any hooks or wires? No. The tin shovel, sir. Look upon it. Take it from the bottle. Do you look within? Do you find any motors or devices of an arcane nature? No, I do not. On the top of the bottle there sits then here a skeleton frame of small size that will fit a pack of cards in that manner. But once put in, cannot be touched. But it could be static electricity. <laughs> you have a cloth, gentle lady. I'll be cautious. Uh, the last person that did that is now a pachyderm. <laughs> <laughs> rub the cloth briskly on your shoulder. Rub, rub, rub. Make a charge. Touch it to the cards. Any sparks? Any attraction? No. Dr. Franklin did experiment many years ago with a gutter pitcher rod and cat's fur, which annoyed the cat terribly, but caused bits of paper to fly about. We have then here the tin shovel. Please cover over the top and hold the stick. Do you enjoy dancing? Not particularly. Not this type of dancing. Ah, no. The cards enjoy dancing. Would you like to see a card dance for you? Sure. Wave the stick back and forth and say, please dance for me. Please dance for me. 
And would not one wave the stick? And if she waves the stick, would not one card slowly make its presence known? Would not one card before your very eyes dance for the gentle lady? If truth she spoke, and did you take a four of hearts? Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You may give her the stick. Now, some say, why does he cover it to deny us ocular clarity? Some say trickery upon the bottle, trickery upon the shovel. No trickery. Shall we have a card dance without cover? Sure. Was your card red or black? It was red. Say red. Red. Diamond or heart? Diamond. Say diamond. Diamond. Do not tell me. You tell me they'll say he knew. Wave the stick. <laughs> Gentle lady, even without waving the stick, did you take a two of diamonds? She has made the two of diamonds dance before your eyes. Thank you. Give it to the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Now, whenever I do this, people say, I think there's a clockwork motor in the shovel. Take it, sir. Pull it from the bottle. Hold it up to your ear. Can you hear the moving of gears, wires, or springs? No. Can you hear the ocean? <laughs> they say, the bottle's a hole for a wire horse. Take the bottle, sir. And look upon the bottle to stick the horse there. Nothing, no wires, no attachments. Place that into the neck, sir and please place it on the table. Some say when I do this, Mr. Potter deceives us by pushing. What if I don't hold the bottle? I ask you, sir, to hold the stick in one hand by your choice as I will step away. Please pick the bottle up. Step forward, sir, and wave the stick below. They say attachment. Wave it above. They say a horse there. Turn it so they can see. Wave it. Does that one card upon the gentleman's head dance, sir? Did you perhaps take an ace of clubs? Yes, he has made the ace of clubs dance, and I thank you, sir, very, very much. Well, I thank you, and Mr. Potter thanks you. Had you been, oh, oh you may. I have been working with Mr. Potter for over 40 years. He has enabled me to quit my day job. <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I honor this gentleman. A black gentleman, a famous gentleman, he was as famous in his lifetime as David Copperfield, David Blaine, Penn and Teller are today. He traveled all over the United States. I have been able to share the magic of Richard Potter. But in a moment, you're actually gonna meet Mr. Potter John Hodgkins wrote a book in which you'll find out Mr. Potter as the citizen, the husband, the father, a gentleman who traveled all over the United States performing the magic and ventriloquism and comic songs and how his family got involved. I can only do his magic. John has done his lifetime biography, and I applaud it highly. Thank you, sir. At least you now have a sense of a little bit of what Richard Potter brought to people. Now, in uh, the 1820s or 1830s, if you were uh, speaking to someone about why Richard Potter mattered, uh, it was fairly easy to give a quick synopsis. He was simply the most famous, the most widely viewed, and the most popular performer in America. Uh, I actually think all three of those modifiers are very significant in different ways, and I'll probably be touching on all of them at one time or another. Uh, and beyond that, I mean, you probably had heard stories and uh, probably didn't know very much. There was a lot more stories than there, were, than there was knowledge. But uh, today I'm going to begin by giving you just a few reasons to think about why Richard Potter matters to us now as opposed to the way he mattered to people in 1820 and 1830. Uh, I'm going to talk a little, very, very quickly about uh, his biography. I will trace his life up into the peak of his career anyway to give you a sense of uh, where he was and what he did and why it mattered. I'm going to try to pay particular attention to his relationships to Portsmouth. Uh, one, of the, one of the real uh, 
wonderful aspects of talking about Richard Potter in New England is that I could actually tailor what I say almost to anywhere I go and uh, find little nuggets or anecdotes that are relevant to the local population. And I'm certainly hoping to do that some today. Let's begin just with a few very basic facts about him. Uh, he was, uh, first of all, as, as you have heard, as you know, he was a black man. His mother was a, uh, from the Guinea area on the coast of Africa who was captured as a young teenager and enslaved, brought to this country, and she was sold in Boston into the household of a rich uh, and titled colonial official, the, uh, the, the uh, head of the Port of Boston, the collector for the Port of Boston. Uh, he had a white father. His father was a local patriarch, a very forceful man, uh, had I think 10 children of his own, seven children, eight children, I've forgotten exactly. He was also a known rogue, uh, sired at least one other uh, son by this same uh, formerly enslaved woman. And uh, yet, as you have begun to get a sense of through uh, Robert Olson's uh, reenactment, Richard Potter came to be uh, not just a widely known performer. He was famous for his gentlemanly behavior, for his good humor, for his uh, quick wit, his repartee, uh, his absolutely irreproachable manners. So he came from a very uh, mean background and he acquired the status and the presence of a gentleman. He came from a very irregular background. He was mixed race and he was illegitimate. And uh, he was very careful to deflect attention from his backgrounds and his origins. Things we would care, reasons we would care about Richard Potter today. It's, it's a fascinating story, or he was an interesting character in his time, so what now? In some respects, that's a fair question. Here are two very basic uh, answers. First of all, as a black man born in 1783, flourishing in the America of uh, President Jackson and so forth, uh, flourishing his career as an independent uh, performer, basically 1809 through 1835. His success was not over, not only remarkable, it was actually incredible. It was totally, totally unexampled. There was no black person in America who had ever attained this level of financial and social and performative success. Uh, you cannot really appreciate the story of black life in America without being aware of Richard Potter's place in it. It was absolutely remarkable. The second thing is that <clears throat> where I started, uh, he was the most famous, the most widely seen and the most popular performer in America. Uh, how could we forget somebody like that? Well, it's, it's not a difficult question to answer because how many opera singers or tragedians or even vice presidents can you name <laughs> from that era? era? Trage tragedians, a few, you probably could. Uh, and, and that itself is relevant. Richard Potter made his living in a kind of art that we would now speak of as popular culture. Uh, lowbrow would be a better word for it. He was an itinerant. Uh, he basically carried his kit with him. He did his own advertising. He did his own shows. He did his own scut work and so forth. Richard Potter was known by everyone, but he was a magician a ventriloquist, a, a, a song and dance man, and so forth. And these were delightful uh, entertainments, but they were not considered serious in the way that a performance of uh, 
Macbeth or a performance of the latest English uh, light comedy brought over uh, from Covent Garden and now performing in Boston or Charleston was considered uh, important, significant, uh, cultured, and so forth. Richard Potter made his uh, life living out this uh, career in uh, an area of culture that we never learned to pay any attention to, any of us when we were in school. Now you would now, I mean, popular culture is a major force in American life today. Uh, Richard Potter was, yeah, he was the predecessor of, of Oprah. He was the predecessor of, he was, the, the predecessor of Black Panther. Uh, but we've lost all of that because it was never thought important. And so because it's so difficult to recover that history, because it is so ephemeral, because the very uh, advertisements that, uh, that put it out there and attract you to it were so easily lost to time, to time, we've lost Richard Potter to time also. So I've been trying to win him back. That's what this is about. Uh, I'm going to run you very quickly through Potter's life until I kind of get to Portsmouth, and then we'll go a little bit more slowly at that stage. He was born, as I said, in 1783. Uh, his, uh, he, he was... Uh, a child on the estate that had belonged originally to Sir Charles Henry Franklin, who was the tax collector for the Port of Boston. Uh, Franklin had died long since. Uh, Franklin's son had also uh, died long since. Uh, and when Potter was born in 1783, slavery had de facto ended in Massachusetts. That happened about 1780. Uh, and so he himself was never technically a slave, but his mother had been a slave until 1780. Uh, most of his older siblings had been slaves for that period of time. Anyway, he lived on this estate in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Uh, Sir Charles had had a magnificent uh, mansion in Boston and also a uh, magnificent uh, country retreat in Hopkinton vast grounds, an enormous mansion, uh, lots of orchards, uh, lots of elaborate flower beds and plantings and so forth. Uh, it all survived the revolution because uh, the people living there then were mostly female or slaves or black or crippled or blind or whatever. It was such, such a hassle that nobody wanted to take responsibility for taking care of them. And so the estate survived. And Potter had a very uh, rural and uh, female dominated, I think it's fair to say, and uh, probably by the conditions of the times, fairly pleasant upbringing in his early years. We know he got some schooling in Hopkinton. Uh, he was taught uh, to read and write and probably to cipher by uh, the woman of the estate who was the twice widowed sister of the woman who married uh, Sir Charles Henry Franklin, which was a, an amazing story in itself, but I won't detour into it now. Uh, Potter lived in this kind of rural retreat for uh, really about uh, eight years or so, and then spent a couple of years, uh, ten, 10 years, spent a couple of years as the estate broke up as a family uh, servant for a member of that extended family. And then in about 1795, on a uh, wedding trip to Boston by his mistress and her new husband, he fell in with a, the family of Samuel Dillaway in Boston. And Samuel Dillaway was a, a very well-established, prominent merchant on the Boston waterfront. He dealt in the maritime trade. Uh, he owned a ship. He traded uh, with France. He, he shipped timber from Maine and, and uh, grain to the eastern seaboard and so forth. Uh, Potter was suddenly in the middle of a big city with a lot of opportunities. Uh, he was certainly in a situation where he would have really learned to 
keep books, to deal with customers every day, to uh, fix problems. Uh, he was always known as a bright, personable, nimble, uh, uh, pleasant individual. And all of these traits would have served him in very good stead. So Potter learns to deal with the public and he learns to take care of business matters and so forth and so on. And uh, he might have had a <clears throat> successful career according to the standards of the day and his race in Boston eventually in a minor little trade sponsored by uh, his master or something. But Around the time that he is uh, 16, he goes to Europe, apparently again as a retainer, as a servant for family members. And in Europe, he makes connection with an Italian tightrope dancer. And this is the beginning of his career as a performer. Potter is then trained as a tightrope dancer a uh, gymnast, a, uh, a, a balancing master, and so forth. And almost certainly this particular uh, performer is a man who later comes to America. His name is Signor Manfredi. Uh, he uh, anglicized that to Peter Manfredi when he came here and, and lived in America. But he was from Italy. Uh, he had performed all over Europe from Constantinople and, and Russia all the way across to Spain and France and so forth. And he comes to this country after a, a first trip to England, probably in 1802, and then to Paris. And then he comes to this country in 1803. And Manfredi is a tremendous hit. Uh, he starts in New York City and he's there for months and months. Originally it's a few days and uh, he's, he's just so successful, they keep him on. Manfredi starts to make his way north through the major cities of the United States then. And when he, he's aiming for Boston, he's announced his destination as Boston, and he goes up to Boston and he just overshoots it. He goes right by and he goes basically straight to Portsmouth. Which brings us to the first slide you have here. And apparently what had happened at that point is that whether Richard Potter had come with Manfredi on that very same ship from Paris to New York City, Calais to New York City, or whether he had uh, slightly preceded him, and I think the former is much more likely actually, but we don't know for sure. But uh, Potter actually lived for a while in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, we learned this from uh, Charles Brewster, a famous uh, mid and late 19th century uh, newspaper editor and town historian who wrote a regular column about Portsmouth life. And uh, he noted this as a little PS from the editor in a, an article about Potter that he re reprinted after Potter's death, 20 years, 15 years after Potter's death. Uh, Potter had been a, uh, a, a very pleasant waiter at the New Hampshire Hotel down on, the, on the, the, uh, the waterfront and so forth. The hotel burned in 1811. Uh, Potter was probably here in Portsmouth at right this time, 1803. And the slide you're looking at here is one of Senior Manfredi's broadsides. Uh, he'd spent all of this time, you know, advertising in the papers in New York and uh, all the way up. And then when he got to Portsmouth, he had his own broadside printed with these amazing woodcuts that were done almost certainly by a, a, a New York artist. And a uh, description of all the things he's going to do. And if you look at them, all of the different pictures are instances of feats that Manfredi is going to perform, whether it's walking on a tightrope with baskets on his feet or doing military maneuvers on the tightrope or, you know, balancing people on himself in, in various pyramid shapes or whatever. These are all from Manfredi's performance. And 
Feats of balancing on the wire with a pole will be performed by a gentleman of this city. Young gentleman, I think it says. This is almost certainly the first time Richard Potter appears in print in advertising as a performer. It happened right here in Portsmouth. <laughs> this was 1803. Uh, when Manfredi gets to Boston, he works his way back by way of towns like, uh, it had to be a big town. You had to have enough altitude to do high wire acts and tight, tight rope acts. But it, through towns like uh, Newburyport and Salem and they get back to Boston and he's set for a long run. He leaves after two nights, even after advertising how he's going to change the performance every night and so forth and so on. And he takes off for Philadelphia because he has just run into another traveling performer who was basically a third-rate magician and actor who had been partnering with these other Scottish performers, one of whom, John Rennie, is about to put together a big multi-star show in Philadelphia. And Manfredi seems to think that this is a special opportunity. And he backs out of Boston almost as soon as he started and heads for Philadelphia. And the person putting on the show there is a, uh, a man, a young man named John Rennie. And John Rennie was the younger son of, uh, well, his, his older brother, James Rennie. Uh, was the more famous performer. James and John Rennie were both ventriloquists. Uh, they both did magic as well. John also did uh, uh, light, light theater, comic drama. And uh, James was particularly good uh, at balancing in equilibrium and so forth. But they were magicians and ventriloquists. They were, in fact, the very first ventriloquists in America. Uh, John came over in 1801, and uh, James, learning that you know, the pickings were good, joined him in November. And they had been performing for uh, several years, sometimes together, but uh, John, James was bossy and controlling, and John was, uh, took, took umbrage, and they were forever separating and going off in a hop and competing against each other, actually, and usually sort of, you know, giving each other a wide berth and so forth. But Richard Potter goes with Manfredi to Philadelphia, and he sees this new act called ventriloquism. And Manfredi has got a family back in Europe. He's clearly heading back to Europe eventually. Uh, Ranny's going to stay, and, and uh, Potter connects with Ranny and starts learning ventriloquism and magic. And then John Ranny is hastening up to uh, Boston to meet to, to Massachusetts to connect with James Ranny again. And Potter then meets James Ranny and discovers. Wow, ventriloquism really is something very, very special. Now remember, there's never been one in America. And ventriloquism exploded into popularity just a few years before this, 18, 1795 basically, and 96 in England. It had, it had been buzzing a little in Paris only, but uh, it was not an entertainment art. It had not existed as an entertainment art. You could not pay to see a ventriloquist anywhere in the world until this time. And right now, these Ranny guys are the only ventriloquists in America. And James Ranny is a very good ventriloquist. And James Ranny, moreover, is planning to travel on to, I guess they connected in New York, is traveling on to Boston and then planning a tour in Canada for a bit, while John Ranny is planning a tour down into uh, the Deep South. So Potter goes with the more attractive option and apprentices himself to James Ranney and works with Ranney for really uh, the better part of six years uh, from this point. We can trace a lot of his career by tracing James Ranney.
Just to give you a flavor of this, uh, this was a typical broadside from the very early 19th. Well, not typical. It's, it's actually fairly spectacular with its woodcuts. Uh, but as a fill in the box for where you're going to perform and uh, what day and what time, it leaves the blanks for the performer to fill those in. So he could carry a stash of these with him. This particular one was in Washington Hall in Salem, I believe, in 1811, but he would have used this one for a couple of years. Uh, he's beheading a rooster, and he will then restore the head, and the bird will be as good as ever. <laughs> Balancing. This is the uh, ventriloquist as an imitator of birds. He is so good that the very wild birds from outside flock to his voice. Uh, he did bird imitations. Uh, this is the ventriloquist showing the imaginary or sometimes actual little dummy figure who, who does the talking. This is another balancing act and so forth. Potter performed with uh, James Ranney doing uh, backup work and helping with the balancing acts and doing some of the tricks possibly for six years. And then in about 189, he goes into business for himself, almost always with the partner at first. This is the earliest known advertising from Potter that we have by just a little. Uh, I decided to put this one up there because it, especially in the early parts of the advertisement, uh, is exactly the language that Potter used in his first performance as Mr. Potter in Portsmouth, which was the second earliest piece of information we have about Potter, the second earliest documentation of Potter's performance on his own, under his own name was in Portsmouth in May of 1809. And this particular performance uh, with a different partner, well, you can see there's Mr. Smith mentioned, and then there's nothing about Mr. Smith. This one, uh, Mr. Smith was going to be presenting uh, balancing, tight, uh, slack rope acts and so forth. And then Potter started performing without Mr. Smith, and he <laughs> cut the handbill apart to cut out the line of Mr. Smith <laughs> doing the uh, balancing acts and so forth and pasted it together and so forth. He couldn't cut out Smith in that one place because it would have ruined the whole poster, but he cut out the other parts and overlapped it and pasted it together and he could still use the advertising. So the handbill dates from very, very late 1808 or early 1809. This appearance with, uh, under his own name with Mr. Smith still stuck in there a little bit dates from February of 1809 and that's in uh, Weston, Massachusetts. And then in May 1809, we have him appearing in Portsmouth. In the book, I don't have it. I th my recollection says it was on Congress Street someplace, but it, it, was, it was, I think it was called the Assembly Hall, but I'm not sure. He, yeah. he played in different venues uh, at different times in Portsmouth, but uh, he often played, even very early in fairly major venues. So now in 189, Potter is starting to build up his own name as a performer. Uh, he, he, he performs with a Mr. Thompson, who was a, uh, the black sheep of a family from Andover, New Hampshire, which is partly related to why he ends up in Andover, New Hampshire, significantly related to how he ends up in Andover, New Hampshire. And uh, then he marries in 188, and his wife is a very beautiful young woman. She's a very graceful young woman. She has a beautiful singing voice. She's really a natural for the show. There is a, uh, a special, uh, they call it the Lilliputian dance, in which she turns from a midget to a giant in the course of the dance yeah. that uh, other performers had certainly made famous. She did duets with, with uh, Richard Potter. She sometimes sang solos. Occasionally they would act out a uh, a scene from a recent popular uh, light comedy. 
Uh, she did these things. She didn't contribute a lot to the act, but she contributed a lot to the tone of the act. And very significantly at this time, Richard Potter's act becomes especially family friendly and female friendly, I think it's fair to say. And I go back to say that uh, in his training, parts I've skipped over, Potter practiced on kids a lot. He did a lot of free street entertaining for the kids who were his neighbors, the kids in the household where he was working and so forth. And he clearly would have been reinforced in his experience that this was great feedback and a great draw. And uh, one, just by the by, one of the important contributions Potter made to American popular culture is that he, more than anyone, made it child-friendly. He deserves particular credit for that, as a matter of fact. In the 19th century, he actually got some credit for making it particular, particularly uh, woman-friendly. Uh, everybody else always said, uh, gentlemen and ladies, but Richard Potter would always say, ladies and gentlemen. Well, in fact, a lot of other people said, ladies and gentlemen, then, too. I've been able to disprove that. <laughs> but nevertheless, the gesture was there. Uh, so he's a married man now. He has his wife helping with his act. Uh, we can follow him as he uh, tours with that act with some difficulty during the War of 1812 because the economy was stifled, especially in New England. Uh, newspapers were shutting down. Advertising was expensive. It's hard to track that sort of stuff, though we've, we've, we've done a fair bit. Then by 1815, when peace comes and the economy suddenly improves with a rush, uh, Potter really expands, his repertory is already enormous, and he expands his range. He starts, uh, not for the first time, but he goes down again on a much larger scale as far as Philadelphia. He's performing in Baltimore, he's performing in Georgetown and Alexandria and, uh, and uh, the, the DC area generally and so forth. He's performing in Providence again. He's doing all of the East Coast pretty much now, upstate New York also. Uh, he starts becoming famous pretty fast. In 1817, he ventures for the first time to New York City. He read, uh, advertises that he'll perform for a few nights. He's got a very nice venue but he's just there to begin with for a few nights. And he absolutely takes the place by storm. He is very well received for all aspects of his performance. The ventriloquism, the magic, the uh, recitations, the songs, they're all extremely popular. But his gentility makes a particular impression. How, how, how gentlemanly like he is in all respects, how, uh, how well dressed, how well spoken, uh, how polite, how courteous, how witty. And the best families start flocking to his performances. And at the same time, he'd barely been there a week, I think, and a very fashionable New York poet publishing anonymously, had just started publishing a series of very, very witty uh, satirical poems in the New York Post that were just, again, fascinating people. Uh, that he was anonymous, that they couldn't figure out who it was. Even the editors of the paper didn't know who he was. Uh, one of his very first poems was to Richard Potter the Ventriloquist. And my, this focused attention on this new act in town. And the uh, poet very wittily revives an old notion that people worried about the powers of ventriloquism, even in the 18th century, had, uh, had introduced. As it happens, just recently in the New York State Legislature, a, a uh, lawmaker from upstate New York, all right, you're New York City, read from the boonies, read upstate Hick, uh, a lawmaker up there in the less civilized part of New York uh, had proposed one of these, and they were not unusual at all, another law to prohibit the 
performance of jugglery and sleight of hands and play acting, you know, lowbrow stuff that was supposed to conduce to vice and to dissipation and wasted time and so forth. <laughs> there were a lot of these laws, especially in New England. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, they, they, the, uh, uh, the culture elsewhere in the country was different. And of course, it was changing here. And by this time, theater was really popular in Boston even. But it's still, there was that anti-theatrical impulse. And that's just the theater. I mean, when you're talking about the itinerant individual magician, ventriloquist, or, you know, uh, trickster, it's all the stronger. So the poet says, oh, Mr. Potter, you're going to be out of a job. Uh, and the way he put it actually reflects uh, Othello's occupations gone. Even then, even though he'd never been there before, a lot of people in New York knew that Potter was a black man. Probably most of the public didn't, but a lot of people did. Uh, oh, Mr. Potter, uh, it looks like you're going to be put out of work. Well, listen, I've got a great solution. Since you're so good at this speaking thing, and since you're a ventriloquist, we're going to get you in the legislature, and whenever somebody gets ready to put out the usual pontifications and nonsense, you're going to speak instead and throw your voice. You're going to stop his throat and what the good sense will write it up for you. All the good sense and, and good, good ideas that you're going to have is going to be coming out. And you'll do that for everybody. And since you're going to speak for everybody, we're going to make you Speaker of the House. Uh, it's, it's a witty, witty uh, arrangement to, to figure on. It, delighted New York because it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, we're cultured and we're open-minded and liberal and, uh, and you're not. <laughs> and uh, it just made New Yorkers feel great about themselves, great about Richard Potter too. So he is being celebrated by the fashionable poet of the age. This was actually uh, 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 Richard jo Rodman Drake, uh, you know, Richard Rodman Drake. And uh, then another poet starts kicking in and they, they do a, a two-man two poetry thing for a while before they're finally unmasked. They were both very, very reputable poets at the time. So Potter is actually, he is genuinely celebrity at a time when cele celebrity hardly existed except in, I mean, listen, no electronic communications, no steamboats even at this age, no trains. Uh, what you see locally is all you see. And it, you couldn't be a celebrity if you didn't have a big city to be a celebrity in. And Richard Potter is probably the very first one in New York City, actually. There were others who, you know, once the, the pattern had been set, there were greater and greater uh, acclaim for later performers. But this was the first big one. Uh, by this time, he is absolutely the most famous performer in all of New England and New York and so forth. And he then decides to take uh, the, the whole show around the whole country. I thought a graphic for this would be particularly nice. Now remember, this is 1819. Uh, Richard Potter is going around, well, as you see, the entire country as it then existed. Uh, he, uh, coming back to New England, he doesn't pause. He goes straight up, first of all, into Canada. And he performs in Quebec and Montreal. And then almost certainly uh, goes around the, uh, the north side of uh, the Great Lakes and comes down into the country at Buffalo and then starts going across the country through Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. It, it, Richard Potter, his wife, Sally Potter, Benjamin Thompson, who is working as his assistant, probably Benjamin Thompson's wife, though we don't know that with certainty. So four or possibly three of them making this incredible trip. 
And Potter is trying to basically accumulate a nest egg so that he can retire to his country estate before he gets burned out by the travel and, uh, and the, the dangers of the road, really. Uh, now, I'll, I'll linger on parts of the map in a minute, but for a minute, just picture this. It's 1819, and this is all, with the exception possibly of the Mississippi River stretch, by land. And nobody has ever appeared so widely in America as this before. Uh, presidents didn't campaign then. There were no national political tours of any kind. Uh, theater companies mostly uh, popped in and out of the big East Coast cities. We did by this time have regional touring theater companies. Uh, there were two or three uh, that were fairly you know, sustained by this time, but they tended to do the same circuits year after year. It might be a circuit on the Mississippi River, it might be a circuit through uh, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, or Kentucky, Ohio, uh, and, and Indiana, and so forth. I don't think anyone had ever pursued a tour of this length before. Remember, just leaving this, that Richard Potter was a black man, uh, and he, he was a very, I knew I would get questions like that, I might as well address them now. Richard Potter, first of all, was uh, visually, you couldn't say, you couldn't look at him and say, oh, that's a black man, or that's a white man. You just couldn't say. He was a light mulatto, was the way people described it. He was often mistaken by both white men, well, we know by white men, I don't guess we have first-hand black man testimony to this. He was often mistaken by white men as a dark-complexioned white man. Uh, he was known in the entire Boston area as a black man because that's where he was from. Everybody knew who he was. But elsewhere, he was what you thought he was. And what you thought he was was very exotic and very interesting and uh, maybe foreign, maybe foreign. He encouraged uh, confusion about this. He did not deny his race, but he didn't... Uh, uh, he didn't assert it either. It was terrible business. Uh, if you were, remember, almost all of his paying audience were white people, almost all of them. There were certainly exceptional times uh, when that was not true, but for most of his career, most of the people paying money to see him were white. He, d he couldn't, uh, you know, damage the chance, you know, opportunity for certain venues or, or audiences by, by making an issue of his race. He did a lot with his race in ways that maybe we can address in the questions, but I won't address that now. But very, very quickly, he's a light-complexioned black man or a dark-complexioned white man. He comes into town, he's dressed like nobody is rich enough to dress in your town. He's very expensively and finely dressed. He is very well spoken. He is an absolute gentleman. He is famous for his decorum and his behavior. He is, is uh, he, 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 he lets insults pass him by. He doesn't take offense and so forth. And he's coming into Natchez and uh, his chief assistant is a big, bluff, white man, good with horses, totally forceful, uh, who's white and calls him sir and boss. That's not a black man. Basically, he was a tremendous, he was a performer. He was a performer all his life. Uh, his wife? His wife traveled with him for this entire tour, and she quit traveling with him after this, and this lasted five years. He begins this in March of 1819 and finishes in December 23, January 24. Okay, there is obviously so much more about his life, and I've frankly left out most of the racism he encountered, most of the sad things that happened to him, but 
I just wanted to give you a sense of why he was important. Uh, and I will, I will close with just a note on that. Uh, I'd mentioned that he was uh, one of the most, the most beloved performer in America, that he was the most famous. What does it mean to be the most widely viewed performer in America? More people had seen Richard Potter in person than had seen, I think it's fair to say, anybody else in America at that time. Now, and I, 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 I put this in the afterword of my book. It had, for me, such a punch that I wanted to share it that way. When Frederick Douglass started campaigning as an abolitionist in 1841, uh, photography, portrait photography, had just come into existence. 1841, a portrait lens for the daguerreotype camera was invented. And Frederick Douglass started sitting, seating, uh, uh, sitting for photographs in 1841 and did so very deliberately throughout his life. And he was, as a book discovered for us a few years ago, the most widely photog photographed individual in America in the 19th century. It was an incredibly powerful part of abolitionist statesmanship. Douglas, as you probably know, was a handsome man. He was always a well-dressed, he too knew he was always on view. He was always well-dressed. He always was uh, solemn in his photographic appearances and so forth. He projected an image of respectability and decorum and dignity that was incredibly powerful and incredibly influential in American history. And he was able to project it throughout the whole country because the photography now existed and photographs, it was thought, really told the truth. People believed them in the way you wouldn't believe a racist stereotype character of a, of a, uh, a minstrel or pick at any cartoon or something like that. They would believe it. You go back right before Douglas, Potter died six years before Douglas started sitting for photographs. And the one American who has been seen by more other Americans is this man who is famous for his gentlemanliness, his respectability, his decorum, his good humor. Richard Potter was doing that mission right then. He was, he was Douglas's precursor. He really was. And we have never appreciated that because we've never known to look for it. But we're going to start to appreciate it now. Richard Potter is going to be a very famous man again. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Time for a few thank questions. You. Yes, so um, we don't have a roving mic, so if you um, can come you can, forward. You can rove that one. Um, I'm gonna have um, also Bob to come up for, oh, okay. for Q&A, so, sure. so we can have you both Absolutely. Out. Of Richard Potter? No, he actually had his painting, had his portrait painted in 1815 uh, by a uh, Boston painter, uh, Ethan Allen uh, Greenwood. Greenwood, Greenwood, Ethan Allen Greenwood. Uh, that painting has never been noted since it happened in 1815. We have a, I can make a few guesses as to what might happen to it, but it does not exist. It has never been found. So we have no idea what he exactly what he looked like. Yeah. Yes, in the very back. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to some of the racism that he experienced? Because you're basically tracking a whole southeastern quarter going through all of the plantation areas. Yeah. So yeah. I'd just be curious if you could like a he was, he was certainly not recognized as black in Natchez, we know from newspaper reports. There is a very powerful anecdote from Mobile that he was turned away as a nigger by a hotel keeper. And he didn't deny it, and he didn't fuss, and uh, he stayed in Mobile he, at another hotel, and he performed for two weeks, and they left town not by the road they'd said they were taking uh, to the place they said they were going or on the day they said they were going. They left uh, a day early in a different direction for obvious reasons of concerns with, it is said, $4,800 nailed up in a nail keg. Uh, 
that number is possibly questionable, but the anecdote is pretty, pretty solid, apparently. Uh, that was a rare sort of incident then. Racism affected him in all sorts of ways in the ways you would expect when he was a minor and a, uh, a dependent and so forth. Uh, in his performing life, it affected him much more in the last, let's say, 11 years of his life because the, 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 the tone in America had turned a lot nastier. And uh, he starts having a lot of trouble with clearly race-related harassment in 1823 in Rhode Island, runs into some of it in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, it shows up as an element in lawsuits that are brought against him a few times. Uh, and there is a, uh, a really long, horrible episode involving his daughter, which clearly had racist undertones, where in Andover, New Hampshire, the community really just doesn't quite know how to support him at a really nasty time and so doesn't, just kind of ignores it. Uh, that said, I think it's also fair to say that uh, rather than the innumerable harassments and offenses he experienced, he is so much more important for the triumphs he produced and the accomplishments uh, he, uh, he had, that they become uh, what we best know him by now, I would say. Up in the very front. Was his wife black and did she travel with him? His wife was black. Uh, she was said to be like him in complexion by many who knew them. So she was a, a light colored black or could be, could be dis you know, imagined as a, a dark complexioned white woman. Uh, she did travel with him occasionally in the, uh, not at the very beginning of their marriage. And they had three children, so she was sometimes unable to travel for that reason. But uh, she traveled with him occasionally in uh, 1811 and 12 and 1815 and 16 and so forth for occasional uh, trips. And she went with him all the way around the country for this whole five-year tour. And after that, she apparently did not ever travel with him again. Yes. Um, were there, Are there questions for, I mean? Were, were, there, were there children? There were children. He had three children. And, and uh, if the children, if the, the gene pool came out and the children were not high yellow like they were, what kinds of problems did the family experience because of that? We don't know what any of the children looked like. The first child died at the age of seven very early in 1815 uh, or, or 16 uh, in Andover. The second child, a daughter, had a very tragic, very short life and died at the age of 16. And the other son, Richard Jr., uh, was a, a wastrel and ne'er-do-well. Uh, Potter did introduce him into his act as a young man. He performed with his father doing some of the things that Potter originally trained at, uh, balancing, gymnastics, uh, slack wire, that sort of stuff. Uh, and Potter was clearly grooming him hard for uh, the mantle. Uh, the Richard, Richard Jr., uh, Dick, as they later called him in town, <coughs> had skills, but he didn't have uh, expertise as a performer, as a presenter. He could do the tricks, but he didn't have the shtick, basically. He didn't have the the presence of his father. And uh, he trailed off, well, and, and he apparently was uh, something of an alcoholic. He was certainly a wastrel. He blew through the family estate in a remarkably fast time. He actually went and joined the circus for a while for employment. Uh, he, we, we last can trace him doing third level performances in the 1840s, and he sort of disappears. Uh, let me go over here. Yes, in the front. I was wondering, Mr. Olson, what you would have to share with us 
with the discussion we've just been having. Do you have any knowledge of his history? I know you know some of his magic or show. It, 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 magic is easy to research because as you see the broadsides, they list all the tricks that he did, the songs he sang, so you can reconstruct his performance very carefully. What you don't have is the information as the father, the husband, the citizen. And that's where this book is amazing. I know his magic. He knows Richard Potter, um, an amazing individual. So it's hard for me to judge on how much I know him besides the magic, because that's what I focused on for 40 years. Um, I have a question about the magic. Um, I can imagine some of these tricks maybe take years to learn to do uh, the performance, and some take equipment that's very difficult to acquire. Can you talk about some of the tricks that you don't perform, but that, you're, that you uh, understand of his story? Because I don't I read cut the chicken's side. head off. <laughs> <laughs> and I really wanted to do it. I had my family convinced we were going to get chickens, and I went, a 21st, 20th, 20th century audience would not sit through that. <laughs> and then I'm watching the comedy channel, and there's a guy in front of the brick wall doing the cut and restore chicken. So modern audiences would allow me to cut a chicken's head off. You show the head, you lay the chicken on the table, put the head back, and the chicken walks away. Um, the tricks you've seen are all documented from the broadsides. So what you said about hard to learn, magic is easy to learn. It's hard to perform. It's the presentation. There are a lot of people who do magic but shouldn't perform. <laughs> Thank you. What about his education? We understand that he went to school in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, and this would have been we can actually identify the school and identify the families who sent their kids to that school. And so I actually include in the, uh, in the book uh, kind of a synopsis of the a, a summary of the, the kids who would have overlapped with him during that period of time. Beyond that, uh, it would have been practical education, I think. I did, in the course of my research, find two, one note and one letter that he had written. Apart from those, we know only about legal documents that include his name or broadsides that he's filled in by hand a little bit. And he clearly was a very phonetic speller, let's put it that way. He spelled phonetically, he did not spell. But he clearly knew a lot of, uh, you know, for example, he knew, he knew how to spell the word right, W-R-I-G-H-T, to deal with a craftsman, a maker. Well, he worked with a man who had been a, a, a shipwright and a, uh, a house right for some time. And he would have learned that kind of thing in, in the Dillaway's employment. But uh, his education was practical aside from the tutoring by his mistress he got and then the schooling he got and then the practical business experience he got. Uh, over here, yes. There's a, a part of Andover, New Hampshire called Potter Place. That's right. Is that at all? It's associated? Named after him. It is named after him. His house, like everything else he did, was a showpiece. It was meant to be noticed. It wasn't huge, but it was extraordinarily fashionable. Are there photographs of that? I mean, are there pictures of that? Uh, not as it then existed, but with some of the original details still available so that you can reconstruct it mentally, yes. There's a, uh, the earliest photograph I've been able to find is in the book. It's from a stereo view taken 1869. And a lot of it had been obscured by additions on a front porch and so forth then, but you can see it. Uh, the house became noted as the Potter Place. When the railroad came through and they built a station right there, right in what had been his front yard. And when you get off the train at that station, the first thing you would have seen was the Potter Place and Richard Potter's and Sally Potter's grave right there. And they named it the Potter Place Station for that reason. When he first built his house, I'm just going to throw this in, he installed two life-size 
wooden statues of famous individuals, not known who. And it doesn't matter, really. On Clint's beside, either side of his front door, you were going down the 4th New Hampshire Turnpike. And here is this house that is fashionable in a way that only houses in Newburyport and Salem and Boston can be fashionable at that time. And here are these life-size statues either side of the door. Oh, who lives there? He's advertising all the time. I am convinced that Richard Potter was the person who made the decision of where Richard Potter was going to be buried. And right in the front yard, and it still calls that attention to that man. Uh, here, yes. Uh, are there any known ancestors? I'm assuming not. None, None. None that we know of. We have no, not, no one has been able to trace. Uh, I'm sorry, I will go back. Uh, one of the discoveries I made in this book is that his daughter who died at 16 had a baby son. Uh, she was impregnated by a local tavern owner when she was uh, roughly 14 and a half or something, which was so scandalous that the town didn't know how to respond. And it did not respond well. Uh, <coughs> She clearly gave birth, and uh, the son shows up in the census of 1830 as a black male under the age of 10. He would have been approximately one year old at that time and disappeared from all records. We have no idea what the child's name was. We have no idea what happened to him. So no records of lineage. Uh, I keep thinking, I, yes, right there. Can you tell the story about the pig carving? Because I think that was one of the interesting stories. The pig? He, he, he used his ventriloquism and they, they were carving the pig. I can. I think I told that here in Portsmouth last year. So maybe you know about it from that. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very apt Richard Potter anecdote. And I'll, I'll preface it by saying uh, it's the kind of anecdote of a ventriloquist forming, make, fooling someone by way of ventriloquism in a way that makes the person look, you know, stupid or vulnerable <laughs> or whatever. And it was therefore the kind of anecdote that other ventriloquists frequently put in their advertising, often with black gullible victims at stake at the joke, you know, the butt of the joke. Uh, but Richard Potter would never have done something like this in public as a stunt because it would have been embarrassing to someone and that was not his style. It, he, he did not disadvantage people uh, the way a, a more roguish entertainer would. But the story uh, is, and, and we have good reason for thinking it was true that uh, while performing in New Haven and staying at a fancy hotel, and there's some dispute as to whether it was in New Haven or whether it was a very fancy hotel near Branford to the east of New Haven, uh, Richard Potter was staying at the hotel and uh, at this time, this was in the uh, 18, this would have been about 1823 uh, or so, uh, it was custom, you know, hotels were run by uh, the owner, was the host, and so forth. And the dining room was where all the guests ate together, and the hosts presided and uh, served, and so forth. And when Potter, uh, who had been reading in the office, waiting for dinner, uh, when dinner was announced, Potter got up to go into dinner with the other guests and was told by the owner that. He didn't think the other guests would appreciate having a, a, a black man seated with them. And so Potter very quietly just nodded and went back into the office uh, where he had a view of the dining room. And uh, a, a roast pig was the main uh, object on the central platter, the main uh, entree for the, for the meal. And as the host first began to carve the, pink, the pig, it grunted and he st froze and stopped and looked and 
people were kind of nervous around the table. And then he went back and he started to slice the pig and it squealed. <laughs> and the host said, good Lord, this pig ain't dead. And one of the guests who was aware of who Richard Potter was and where he was said, you know, I think if you would ask that gentleman in there to join us, uh, we could eat our pig. <laughs> and I actually have come back to, uh, I, I've mentioned that where it belonged in the chronological account, but I recur to it in the conclusion of the, of the book too, because it's a perfect emblem of how Richard Potter operated in America. A lot of people knew he was black. And by the, the, the longer his life went on, the, the wider that word spread. But if you make a point of that, if you make an, an issue of that, who loses? You don't get your entertainment. You don't have all the fun. And I think it's fair to say there was actually a conspiracy on both sides to ignore the issue because not only was Richard Potter the better for it, but the vast majority of whites who knew he was black made a decision not to point that out or to take note of that because they would lose all the fun if they did. Very significant development. In the far back. So, uh, this may be an obvious question, but it, does that imply that in the anonymous poetry that Potter was the poet? for the anonymous poems that appeared in the New York Post. I don't think you qualified that in your remarks, but it sounded like that's where it was going, so I'm just wondering about that. I, I didn't quite understand that. What were you saying about the poem? Uh, was Richard Potter the author of the anonymous No, 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 no. It was a New York poet, uh, uh, Rodham Drake. Uh, Richard Rodham Drake, I think, was, was the name. He was, he was uh, a very well-respected poet. Uh, working into a new vein of poetry at the time. Now, Potter was the, uh, the object of poetry a few times, but he was, he did write uh, a little bit of doggerel for his shows. We have a couple of quatrains and couplets that he almost certainly wrote himself, but they're just very ordinary things. I haven't looked over here, so if there are any questions, see, there's one right there. Well, I just want to know when you discovered Potter and how long it took you to Sort it all out. Uh, I, I address this uh, front and center in, in the preface to the book, I will say. But the quick story is that I married into a family that had a connection with Andover, New Hampshire, and that actually had a summer home in the Potter pa Place Post Office District. We got, I got my mail in the summer in Potter Place, New Hampshire, for a few years. And it was by the sheer chance of coming to this particular, I'd driven through Andover before, but I'd never stopped and seen things. And in Andover, people know who Richard Potter is still because he is buried there and because he lived there for the last, uh, on and off for the last 20 years of his life. And uh, so I, mean, my, I, I was uh, an English professor. I, I was trained in early 19th century English and American literature and, and, and popular and culture and so forth. So I just eat this stuff up. I love these <laughs> historical. And I was fascinated by this guy. And it took me a while to start thinking, oh, think of all the different things that are happening in America in the 1820s and 30s that are so important to our national story that are all intersecting in this one amazing man. I've got to learn more about this. And I had a very theoretical notion at the beginning. I just wanted to write an article and put some of these ideas into uh, competition with each other and, and just see what sparks flew. And I discovered that you know I could theorize all I wanted to, but there was just nothing to base any of it on because we knew squat about him. And most of what we were told about him was either laughably impossible or demonstrably false or self-contradictory. It was just all smoke and mirrors and hocus pocus. He had told a lot of false stories about himself, but other people made them up. A lot of people got into the business of making up stories about him. I would never so do that. I just started. <laughs> 
I just started digging. And yeah, the, I started digging in the spring of 1992. So it's been a long time. And I, I could never have gotten very far had it not been for the revolution in uh, databases and the computerization of documents and so forth. I've, I've done vast amounts of research and microfilm, God help me, and micro-opaque and, and reading the originals. And I've gone through all these legal archives and, and you know, gotten pretty good at 18th and 19th century scripts. But uh, it was an impossible quest at the time. But it became more possible. But then I went into administration. I, I left teaching and I went into college administration and I never had sabbatical. So I never had a big block of time to work on it. So bits and pieces all the time, but took forever. Uh, yes, you, sir. I've been missing you. Two <coughs> questions. Did he ever do the European tour uh, once he became famous in the US at that time frame? And what did he die from? We do not know what he died from. I'll start with that one. It's the fastest to answer. Uh, it is very clear that even a few months before his death, he did not expect to be dying soon. He was buying new pieces of property. He, was, he, he died at 53. Uh, he he uh, was touring until July or so that year and died in September. On the other hand, uh, the doctor's bills indicate that he probably was being tended by doctors for probably a matter of four weeks. So it was a, a lingering illness, and we don't know any more than that. Uh, Europe, he, I have reason to suspect, and I will just keep it this uh, brief, uh, I think some pretty good and interesting reasons to suspect that with James Ranney, that he accompanied James Ranney to England, France, and even India while he was working with Ranney. And this would have been sometime between later 1805 and early 1807. It's a totally missing period for both of them, but there are a lot of very interesting clues. Uh, that's not known, but there are some really fascinating reasons for believing it. Uh, he later told someone, a newspaper reporter who stopped him and pumped him for information in the early 1830s, told someone that he had performed in the Caribbean. Uh, that probably was while he was still with Rani, and we don't know where or when that would have been, but we have no reason to disbelieve it, and we know that Rani did at other times perform in the Caribbean. That was not unusual to travel in Canada and the United States and the Caribbean uh, and, and, and even really the, the upper coast of South America were all one great big theatrical circuit. And people coming from Europe or coming from here might do one of them or two of them or all three of them. And there was someone behind you, I think, who had a question. Did I answer all of them? Was he never did it by himself. Once he was very popular in the US, he didn't go back to he did not go back to Europe. There were a lot of European competitors coming here, but uh, we, we do not know. He did not go back to Europe after, after that. And yes, you. I have a question for each of you. Um, why did he choose um, Andover, New Hampshire, which is not a country? I don't know. The Chenna Buck. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm curious to know how you got to know him. 40 years ago yeah. to start yeah. his career. I, I Since I was a kid, my aunt got me a magic set and I stuck with it to my parents' full embarrassment. But, but I wanted to do a show at Sturbridge Village, so where I was you know, going to work for a while. So I wanted to do a magician of 1800s. And when I started looking at the modern history of Potter, quote unquote, written by magicians who may not have been the greatest historians in the world, because if I produce an orange now, and you tell somebody I produce a dozen tomorrow, I will not call you a liar. But Potter showed up early by magicians like John Will Holland and Milburn Christopher as the first American magician. And I said, I'm going to do Richard Potter. And then I was able to go back and look at the books. And then I did a show on his front lawn in front of his grave site for the end of Historical Society when they started. It was the weekend of the New England earthquake. 
but nothing happened while I was performing, so I have to assume he may have liked it. <laughs> but I just took history and magic and put them together, and I had been, I've done this tour. <laughs> Chicago, Texas, California, Florida, Canada, England. I've traveled like Richard Potter because of Richard Potter. So I picked a winner, boy, I tell you that. I didn't answer the other part of your question, though I, I, I hinted at it when I talked. Uh, Benjamin Thompson, his assistant throughout this tour and also earlier in his career, was from Andover, New Hampshire. Benjamin Thompson's whole family was living up there. His father was very prominent in town. His brothers became very prominent in town. The old notion was that Potter happened upon it while touring and thought, oh, what a nice place. I'll, I'll make my home here. That's totally uh, backwards. Uh, Richard Potter got there. It was totally off the beaten pack. And it wasn't on the way to anywhere. You wouldn't be touring through Andover to anywhere in 1814 or 1813. But Potter went to Andover, New Hampshire with his friend and, uh, and they, they were apparently were pretty good friends, with his friend and associate, uh, Benjamin Thompson Jr. And the, he, it was very easy to learn there was land available there because the land he first bought was owned by Benjamin Thompson Sr. It was uh, very easy. Uh, there's certainly good reason for thinking that Potter wanted to establish his family at a rural retreat outside of Boston. His wife had alcoholic tendencies, and even though drink was common in New England, it was just amazingly rampant in Boston. And if you're leaving your wife for months at a time while you're out traveling, uh, he wanted a safe memorial retreat for her, I think. Hence, Andover. Do we have time for more questions? I'm... We have time for one more question. Okay, who wants to fight? All right, I see a hand. I have to drive through Potter Place on the way home. I'm looking for that sign that you say is on the road. Can you tell me where uh, it is? The sign that is on the road is on Route 11, just before, it's still Route 4 and 11, it's, as you're headed west. It's on Route 4 slash 11 on the left at a little pullout area just before Route 4 north branches off to the right at the top of a hill before Route 4 branches off to the right. You can see the railroad station from that corner that says route. Potter Place. The railroad station and Potter's Grave are on a separate little loop road just downhill from that. And you can find them if you get, if, once you stop at the little sign, if you want to see it. If you continue west and then take the very first left, it takes you right down to the station, and Potter's Grave is right beside it. Used to be. Used to be. Okay, well, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you.